This week is about vector fields. I know the definition, I have some key interpretations in fluid dynamics and fields of force, and I have a description of the paths formed by their fields using integral curves. In this video, I want to talk about derivatives. Like parametric curves and scalar fields, I need to do some work to see how the basic idea of rate of change extends to this new object of a vector field. Vectors have multiple components. What does it mean to measure their rate of change, both in various directions and with regard to various input variables? The operator that makes this work is nabla, this upside-down right triangle. I used this before with scalar fields to define the gradient. This is a vector operator, where each component was a different partial derivative. In R2, nabla is the operator del over del x, del over del y. In R3, del over del, del over del z is added. And I can generalize this to Rn as well, if I wish. However, for this entire section on vector fields, most of what I will be doing is in R3, so I'll not worry too much about the generalization. The operator nabla is a vector, a vector formed of other operators yet, but in form, a vector. Therefore, it can act with other, interact with other vectors using vector operations. And there are two of these that I want to consider, the dot product and the cross product. First, the cross product. This is, of course, confined to vectors in R3, since the cross product is not defined in other dimensions. But in R3, I can take the cross product of the operator nabla and a vector field f. In terms of components, it has this form. This is called the curl of a vector field, and it is the first of the two new derivatives. It is a combination of the various partial derivatives of the component functions of the vector field. Like scalar fields, all of the generalizations of the derivatives are somehow made out of various partial derivatives. So what does this one do? Well, curl measures the tendency of a vector field to cause local rotation. Using the fluid flow inter in interpretation, if I drop an object into the fluid, it will flow along the integral curves of the vector field. However, as it flows along, it may also start spinning about an axis. Curl measures the tendency of the vector field to cause such a spin. This is very different from global rotation. The paths of rotation themselves may be circular without actually causing the object to spin, and likewise the paths could be totally straight, but still cause a local rotation. So don't confuse um, the large-scale curving of paths with the local rotation of spinning. This is an important interpretation of rate of change for higher dimensions. It is rotational change. The curl measures rotational change, and a field with zero curl is called irrotational. It causes no local rotation. That was the cross product. I can also define the dot product of nabla with a field f. The dot product of two vectors is a scalar, so the output here is a scalar field. It is the sum of all the matching partials, the first partial of the first component, the second partial of the second component, and so on. What kind of change does divergence measure? Divergence measures the tendency of a field to diffuse. Thinking in terms of gaseous fluids, a positive divergence at a point means that the density of the gas is, to, is increasing. Some directions of flow may be inward and some outward, but there is a net diffusion of the gas. Sorry, the density is, is decreasing. If the divergence is negative, then the density is increasing and there is a net gathering of the gas. A vector field with zero divergence is called incompressible. There is no local change in density. The compressible-incompressible divide is of major importance in fluid dynamics. Both liquids and gases can be described by vector fields, ocean currents, for example, for liquids, or wind directions, for example, for gases. But water and air have very different behaviors, and the major source of that difference is compressibility. Gases are compressible, and their density can change significantly. Liquids like water are, under reasonable circumstances, basically incompressible. Their density is constant. Now that divergence has been defined, I want to double back to scalar fields briefly and define one more operator. 
if f is a scalar field, then the gradient of f is a vector field, the vector field that points in the direction of greatest change. I haven't talked about this vector field much, but gradients of scalar fields are among the more useful and important vector fields, and there'll be more about this next week. Since the gradient is a vector field, I can apply the new operators to it. In particular, I can apply the divergence operator, which gets me back to a scalar field. The result is an operator called the Laplacian. It takes a scalar field and produces the sum of all pure second partials. In three variables, the second partial in x plus the second partial in y plus the second partial in z. Why is the Laplacian important? Well, it's the key ingredient in many important multivariable differential equations. On the slide here, I start with two equations that have only one variable of position, x. The first is the heat equation, which governs the diffusion of heat, and the second is the wave equation, which governs propagation of waves. In each, the function depends on t and x, time, and then a single variable of position. This is heat diffusion along a line or wave propagation in a single direction. However, heat diffusion and wave propagation happen in three dimensions in the world. The single variable versions are useful learning models and have some specialized application where a system can be reduced to a single direction, but they are not particularly general. I need the three-dimensional versions. Those versions have the same left side, the time derivatives, but the right side now needs a second derivative in multiple variables. The tool that does this is the Laplacian. These two latter equations govern heat diffusion and wave propagation in three variables. I'm not going to solve these equations in this course, but I'm talking about them to show one of the ways that these new differential operators are used. These are fundamental equations. Waves and diffusion are two of the basic physical processes. These equations and more complicated DEs built on them are ubiquitous, and they are described using the Laplacian, which is the divergence of a gradient. Let me finish this video with some properties. First, all of the operations that use Nabla are linear, gradients of a scalar field, curl of a vector field, divergence of a vector field, and the Laplacian of a scalar field. In this slide, I use capital letters for vector fields and lowercase for scalar fields, which is a convention I'm going to stick with for the rest of the course. In each of these four, I can split up the operation over addition and subtraction, and I can pull out constants, as you've seen many times, for linearity. These are derivatives, so they should have some kind of Leibniz rule, some product rule. But what products actually make sense? Some of these act on vector fields, and some act on scalar fields. So I have to make sure that whatever product I am using, the operations actually line up with them. Here, then, are three identities. First, if I have two vector fields in R3, then their cross product is also a vector field in R3. The divergence of the cross product satisfies this first identity. The divergence of the cross product is equal to the curl of f dot with g minus f dot with the curl of g. Two things to point out here. First, this is still a Leibniz type rule. There are two terms, and I differentiate f in the first term and g in the second, each time multiplying by the other. But second, this is a strange version of the Leibniz rule. I started with divergence on the left, but the derivatives on the right are both curl. Also, this is now subtraction instead of addition. And this happens as calculus evolves. Many operations fit the broad style of a Leibniz rule, but there are strange and subtle differences. I'll leave the proof of this to the activities or the assignment. Instead of cr the cross product, I also have scalar multiplication. I can multiply by a vector by a scalar. Therefore, I can multiply a vector field, capital F, by a scalar field, lowercase f. And I can take the divergence or curl of this multiplication, and in both cases, I also get a Leibniz rule. But again, there are some interesting subtleties. For the divergence of a scalar multiplication, I get little f times the divergence of capital F plus the gradient of little f dot capital F. The two derivatives in the Leibniz rule are different. However, that makes sense. Capital F is a vector field, 
So the divergence is a valid operation, but little f is a scalar field, so divergence doesn't make sense, but gradient does. Similarly, the multiplications are different. The first multiplication is just the ordinary multiplication of two scalar fields. Little f is a scalar field, and the output of divergence is a scalar. In the second multiplication, the gradient is now a vector, and capital F is also a vector field. So to get a scalar from them to add to the other scalar, the dot product is used. Again, I'll leave the proof of this to the activities or the assignment. Finally, the cross product pattern here is directly in, par in parallel with the divergence pattern I just did. The curl applied to scalar multiplication has a Leibniz rule where one of the derivatives remains curl and the other becomes gradient. Finally, let me ask what happens when I do one of these after another. I already have one example. The Laplacian is the divergence of the gradient. It's an important operation, but it's the outlier for the composition of these operators. The other two operations that are natural to consider, the curl of a gradient and the divergence of a curl, are both zero. Again, no proofs in this video, but some will be shown up in the activities or assignments. This is pretty surprising, I think. Zero curl means a field is irrotational. It produces no local rotation. This means that all gradient fields are irrotational. A gradient can never produce a local rotation. Similarly, this says that all curls are incompressible. A field that describes local rotation also happens to not have any changes in density. Right now, that's a pretty difficult thing to parse, but I'll have more to say about this in future weeks. And these identities will be quite important before the course is finished.